Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for being here today. My name is Angie Braley, and I'm the River Training Center Coordinator for River Management Society. And I've been helping coordinate this River Career Discussion Series. This was a set of four different sessions learning about building a career related to rivers. And this is our last one of the four. However, if you'd like to go back or you were unable to join us for some of the previous sessions, you can find them on our YouTube channel. I just put a link in the chat there. Um, and then I also put a link to our career series playlist, which is all videos taken over the last uh, recordings taken over the last few years related to river careers. So you can check those out on your own time as well. And uh, also check out the descriptions for those videos. You'll see lots of resources linked there as well. Well, today we are here to explore some emerging trends and future opportunities related to river careers. And I'm really excited. We've got a great panel. Um, and I'm going to just go ahead and have them introduce themselves. But today we've got Tanji Akasi Otu from the Forest Service. We've got Kestrel Coons from American Whitewater. And we've got Ben Fowler from Parks 360. And so, yeah, how about Tanji? Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Let us know a little bit about the kind of work that you do and how it's related to rivers. Okay, sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Tanji Cassio too. I'm coming to you from Northern Virginia this afternoon. Um, yeah, as Andy said, I work with the Forest Service, and in particular, one of our programs is the Wilderness and the Wild and Scenic Rivers program, and each of those manages two pretty incredible systems of lands and waterways. And since I work at the Washington office, a lot of what we do is we provide a bridge between the agency and Congress at times. And then we also work to be really strategic about our partnerships, our resources, our research, our networks, um, to provide all the support to our field managers um, who are getting all that information, building the skills, having contact with the community each and every day. So. We seek to work as a support team at the national level to all of our folks across the country who work on um, wild and scenic rivers. Awesome, thank you, Tanji. How about Ben? Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely, Angie. Uh, can you hear me, first of all? Yes. Yeah, so my name is Ben Fowler. I'm actually in uh, in Germany right now. My, my wife is from Germany, so it's a little bit dark and gloomy back there. It's about eight o'clock and uh freezing uh but it's nice weather but yeah really excited to be here if, if i wasn't on the panel uh, i would certainly be on this webinar anyway because i'm always curious about uh emerging trends and what's happening around rivers um first and foremost i am a river management society member i have been now for two or three years uh if you haven't signed up for the symposium i'm not trying to take your thunder angie but definitely go to that because that's where we all get to meet and hang out and talk about rivers uh but yeah so I've got my my legs kind of straddled between two two boats right now. On one hand, I'm finishing up my dissertation, my PhD uh, in parks conservation and uh, outdoor recreation management. I specifically focus on uh, visitor use management, uh, in particular around rivers and access design. And then on the other hand, uh, the reason I haven't finished my PhD is because uh, I started my own consulting company called Parks 360, uh, where I do work with parks and I try to basically provide data of different types uh, so park, parks and park managers can um, get solutions or so find solutions to their problems. And then um, I also work with a company called Terrain 360, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, essentially, in some of the research I was doing, I got involved in 360 imagery, so similar to what uh, Google Street View is, but doing that for rivers and trails and other natural resources. So hopefully I'll get to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, but yeah, that's me. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you, Ben. And Kestrel. Hi, everybody. My name is Kestrel Coons. I'm the Southern Rockies Protection Director for American Whitewater. And I'm based in Crestview, Colorado on the Western Slope in the Rockies. 
And um, I imagine most folks have heard about American Whitewater, but we are a national river advocacy organization that really works at the conjunction of recreation and then also river conservation. And so really inspiring outdoor and specifically river enthusiasts to step up and, and have a voice and, and help with you know, both local, regional and national policy efforts um, that are happening around the country. And I, um, I do have a, I have a bachelor's in both water science and environmental policy. And I've been with American Whitewater for a little over eight years now, but I certainly didn't start out as a program director. Um, I started out as a part-time intern, bopping around to different Colorado River events and doing outreach. And so I've definitely learned a lot about this job just from doing it and doing a lot of things wrong and doing some things right. And, um, but it's been a really awesome journey. And, and I think also kind of ditto to what Ben said about the symposium. I actually um, met Angie and Tangie and Ben all for the first time at the last symposium a couple of years ago in Texas. And it was a blast. Awesome. Thank you, Kestrel. So today I've prepared some questions for our panelists. We're going to go through and have them answer, but I encourage all of you out there to put any questions that you might have in the chat as well, and uh, we can try to get those answered. We have some time at the end to maybe take some questions as well. So um, this first question that I have is for Tanji, and it asks... How have you seen federal policies and priorities shift in response to climate change or public demand for river conservation? And what new roles or skills are becoming necessary within federal agencies? Thanks, Angie. Yeah, so this is a very timely and interesting question, especially the first part of the question in regards to federal policies and priorities since we're anticipating an administration change. Um, but I will highlight a few outcomes um, over the past few years that did result in some pretty substantial work and outcomes and tools and resources within our program. And then definitely talk about the latter half of the question in regards to roles and skills um, that are much needed in the Forest Service. And so, in regards to the first part of the question, um, some of my colleagues work really closely on a secretarial memo, which comes from the USDA secretary. In my case, the Forest Service is under the USDA. Um, and that was under the topic of climate resilience and carbon stewardship. And so there's a number of different directions for all kinds of programs, but for wild and scenic rivers in particular, um, some of the ways that our colleagues have started to build out some resources and implement things related to climate resilience is building a really amazing database called the Forest Service Climate Risk Viewer. And so a lot of our researchers have put together amazing um, geo databases that allow us to look at different trends um, and sort of come up with a narrative around the vulnerability of the landscape to different changes. And so um, being able to utilize that tool in the context of planning, which is really a huge component of the Wild St. Rivers program as well, because there's actually a pretty substantial number of federally designated rivers that don't yet have clear management plans or management plans at all. And so there's so much space for engagement and input on that process from communities um, and forests in order to develop those plans and tools like this, talking about climate change and being able to visualize it um, is a really key skill. And so, when that comes to like being a practitioner or manager, um, I think what that really equates to is learning the language of adaptive management. What are we aiming for, right? Um, for any given landscape, we seek to find a unified lens about desired conditions, you know, that includes all kinds of viewpoints. But um, if there's a lot of change that occurs rapidly, 
are there conditions that can change to a degree that they're you know, no longer something that we can actively manage towards. Um, and so learning to be really strategic about being adaptive and considering the whole ecosystem lens of what you're managing is a really key skill set right now. Now, the other item that I wanted to mention to you in re regards to skills or sort of topics of interest right now has to do with recreation and access. Um, there's been a really cool study that recently um, tried to pull together a big body of research and conversation around the topic of access and sort of allocating access, right? Um, different waterways and recreation sites, you know, receive a lot of visitation or have differing pressures. And so as managers, you're always thinking about um, the resource and the communities and how they fit together. And so um, recently the Wild and Scenic Rivers community had a really wonderful webinar hosting a few folks who put together that body of research and conversation around access and in particular this idea of like rationing and allocating access to different sites and put together sort of a guide um, called the planning principle for fair distribution of scarce recreation resources. And so um, there's a lot of different strategies to do that, but what they really wanted to do was include what does it look like to have equi equity sort of as the lens for each stage of that process and planning um, around recreation. And that's a huge um, opportunity for folks to come and look through those ideas and um, come up with new strategies. So that's definitely a desire of our river loving community is to um, learn how to allocate those kind of resources in a way that makes sense. So yeah, that's where I'll pause for now. And I'll pass it back to you, Angie. Thanks, Angie. Um, lots of good key terms that I heard mentioned in there that are very topical and timely right now. All right, so my next question is for Ben, and it asks, how do you envision the role of technology, particularly drones or GIS mapping, evolving in river restoration and river management? And what advice would you give those give to those who want to specialize in tech-driven conservation? All right, so that's that's a great question. It's also a timely question. Um, so I guess, you know, where, where to start? So, uh, that it, it's a loaded question. There's lots of words, there's technology, there's river restoration, there's management. Uh, you know, one of the things for me, I mean, thinking about technology is I have to remind myself that technology is not always electric electronic. Uh, it is really just the application of, of knowledge, uh, and tools to solve problems. And so, uh, there's lots of different forms of technology that are happening uh, right now, and we could go to the level of uh, Kevlar boats, lightweight boats that are enabling people to, you know, carry their boats through longer journeys to um, drones and, and GIS, which which I'll talk about. Um, also, river restoration, and I'll, I'll upload a little document. Uh, I did a little bit of research before this, but, um, you know, river restoration um, has a lot to do with um, modifications to river channels um, and uh, adjacent riparian zones. Um, and then river management, um, just like the River Management Society, you guys wear a lot of hats. You cover a lot of different things. They could be around water supply, flood control, agriculture, recreation. So, uh, there's many, many different facets uh, to that question. Uh, my role or my perspective on that with using drones and GIS uh, is really around recreation. So just a little bit about, about my story. Um, about two years ago in my dissertation um, uh, coursework, I was able to take a drone course. Um, we might have some pilots that are um, on, the, on the call today, but essentially based, uh, a drone or an unmanned aerial vehicle um, they're very, very popular right now. You can get a drone, a basic consumer drone, you know, for as cheap as $20. That's probably going to, you know, uh, crash the first time you use it. Or you can get a drone, you know, that's, that's uh, $50,000 that has different sensors. Um, but if you want to get your certification, it's called a Part 107. 
Uh, there's lots of different agencies where you can go and get a certification. Hang on one second. My son is uh, knocking on the door. Yes, Lenny, I'm on a call. Okay, thank you, buddy. He's telling me dinner's ready. Um, it's I'm, I'm in Germany. It's 8.30 here at night, so I apologize. <laughs> um, so, okay, thank you so much, buddy. You can say hi. <laughs> Um, so if, if you want to go, um, pursue the drone life, you absolutely can, you can get that certification. Obviously you can fly recreational or you can fly commercial. Uh, so I got my certification about two years ago and almost immediately I was able to find work. Um, obviously with drones, GIS or geographic information systems, that's intertwined. So everywhere you're flying, everywhere you're taking pictures, um, in those pictures or in that metadata, there's spatial information that's tagging exactly where you take that, um, where you take that imagery. And so I, for one example, just to show how um, uh, expansive the drone industry has gone, I would imagine um, uh, Tangi at the USDA, uh, they probably have a drone team. The National Park Service or any DOI agency probably has a, a drone team. Um, American Whitewater, uh, Kestrel, they're probably used to using drone imagery for planning or for other resources. Um, and so drones have really taken over uh, the industry. And likewise, there are at any sort of um, organization, there's usually whole GIS teams that are specializing in um, that type of data that need that data to make decisions. Thank you. Can you go tell mommy? He just told me that he has a, a poopy. This is hilarious. I would, I'm glad we're recording, Andy. Um, and so, so yeah, so so drones um, are. You can see drones really everywhere right now. So one of the things that that I've used drones most recently for a project uh, is with Iowa DNR, Iowa Department of Natural Resources, and they are doing a master planning process for the Little Sioux River, which is in Northwest Iowa. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the, the 360 mapping or the 360 imagery um, that I'm also involved in. Uh, but drone use for, for, in this case, you know, it, it provides an aerial view of a river. Um, it provides video, it provides imagery, it provides a, a totally different perspective um, of the river. And so if, if you haven't seen drone imagery of river, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty neat. Uh, what I'd really like to do, Angie, if you don't mind, could we try and share one of those videos? Um, and I can kind of talk through it a little bit. Uh, one of the things that we use the drone imagery for uh, is education. And so specifically in the case of this Iowa um, DNR, the, the Little Sioux River here, um, this river, it's about 170 miles. They're trying to open it up for a water trail, but there's lots of agricultural crossings. And so this river shows here, um, my, um, my expedition buddy here, he's paddling. We have a 360 camera attached to, uh, to that kayak. Uh, but multiple times throughout that river, you cross these really large ag lands with, with, with lots of cattle. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of times these cattle can be just in the middle of the river. Um, yes, what a view, it's very sinuous, meandering. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, but there isn't a lot of education around how do you paddle uh, when you're, you know, when you experience these uh, these cattle in the river. Um, this was honestly my first time paddling where you had, you know, potentially 200 cattle that were in the middle of the river on a hot day. And how do you safely feel like you can you can cross? And so uh, videos like this we can use in education, we can use in stakeholder or community engagement. Um, it shows people the resource in a really beautiful, unique way, but it also shows what happens almost on every cow encounter where they sort of rush you and you think they're going to stampede you in the water, but they're really just getting excited and then they take off down, um, down the bank and they kind of follow you. So this was just a really cool video that we caught um, when, we, when we were doing this. Uh, so thanks for showing that, Angie. So... That is just one specific example of how I'm using uh, drones and some of the work that I'm doing. And it's really just to open up access to these rivers, show them in a different way, use them for education. Um, and then one other thing I'll, I'll see if I can show real quick. Oh, okay. Well, I can show it later, but um, it's just the 360 imagery. So we have it on the ground view of, of what that looked like as well, which is pretty cool. Um, so what advice would you give those to, to uh, who want to specialize in tech-driven conservation 
Well, remember, tech is not just uh, electronics. Uh, it's applying scientific uh, knowledge to solve problems. So first, I would say, you know, if, if you can, if you can do it um, with your time, if you have the ability to do it, if you have the finances to do it, go back to school, um, especially over these next four years uh, might be a good time to go back to school. I don't know what the federal job situation will look like, uh, but go back to school, go deep into specializing in some sort of skill or, or knowledge. Um, and hearing Tanji talk, one of my biggest regrets was getting into policy. Um, if, if you want to stay involved in, in any sort of conservation, uh, especially around rivers, you need to understand policy. So become aware of that. Uh, and then last but not least, I would absolutely stay engaged with the River Management Society. I think, I don't know how often you guys use it, Angie, but you have those core competencies that you've developed. Um, and so you can find those on the website and those core competencies really sort of lay a platform for all the different areas that you can um, delve into when it comes to river management. So definitely check, check those out. All right, that was my answer. Yes, thank you, Ben. And thanks for sharing that video. That was really interesting. And as you mentioned those core competencies, um, I'm gonna put a link here in the chat to a page that we've uh, just recently put together around those core competencies. Not only does it link to the core competencies that were developed by the Interagency Wild and Scenic Rivers Coordinating Council, but it also has some other resources there, um, even like a previous recording and a little self-evaluation spreadsheet. So I encourage folks to, to check that out. All right, my next question is for Kestrel. And it says, uh, asks, advocacy and policy play a crucial role in river management. What trends do you see emerging in river-related advocacy, and how can early career professionals best support policy change or community-led stewardship? Thanks, Angie. Yeah, no, it's a, this is a great question. And, you know, since this is about policy, unfortunately, it's, you know, somewhat related to Yesterday in today's election results, I was hoping to kind of avoid that topic entirely today, but um, it may come up a little bit here. Um, but I wanted to mention primarily two things in terms of emerging trends in the conservation and, and advocacy world. Um, the first is, as you know, some of you may have picked up and gathered in the past couple of years, it, but it has become increasingly challenging to get bipartisan support for wild and scenic river protections and for other public land um, protections like national monuments and um, wilderness and other tools that we have to protect rivers and their landscapes um, into the long term. At American Whitewater, we do have the opportunity to really elevate the voice of outdoor recreation and the benefits that that has on tourism and you know both community um, small scale economies, and then also, of course, the larger um, US economy as well. And so that's something where we are able to get some really tangible bipartisan support for. But when we really go and try and achieve those landscape wide protections that outdoor recreation depends on is where we're, we're falling short. And I do think that with the recent and kind of ongoing election results here that may become increasingly challenging over the next few years as well. And so I think something that advocates can do both, you know, on the ground and at the regional level is to really try and elevate the voices and needs of local communities. And so if we can build more diverse community support on both sides of the aisle for protecting rivers, then I think we have a better opportunity at convincing congressional leaders in DC that there's merit there and that their constituents on the ground really want to see um, these changes and improve protections for rivers. And so kind of, you know, thinking about some tools that that you might need or want to have in order to have those conversations, you know, I really do think that to be an effective advocate, it really starts with being able to effectively communicate both, you know, verbally and, and written communication as well. And then also just the ability to to kind of build relationships with a broad variety of people. Um, and these aren't necessarily skills that you'll you know, only learn in school. Um, I think a lot of this comes from just doing it. Um, 
And then, you know, I think that sets like a good baseline of, you know, where can, where can you start? And then I think tying into some things that Tangi and Ben shared as well, like on top of that, I think that there, you know, there's a lot of merit in having some technical specific skill sets as well. And so using GIS to communicate, um, that's kind of all, you know, part of your potential tool set. Um, but at the very minimum, I think focusing on your communication skills and relationship building can get you a long way, um, especially when these conversations start to get more difficult. Um, and then kind of a second thing I wanted to touch on is um, related to tribal nations and the tools that they have or that they want to have um, for protecting rivers. And so at least during the Biden administration over the past few years, there's been a lot of focus on empowering tribes to have more tools to achieve land sovereignty um, and, and to achieve, you know, kind of other ways that they can protect rivers either on their official nation lands um, or on their historical and, and cultural sacred lands as well. And so this has come both in the form of formally returning lands and rivers to tribal nations, but also policies um, for tribes and the federal government to formally co-manage landscapes like national monuments um, and other federally designated um, areas. And so, you know, I'm not quite sure that Trump is going to, the Trump administration will have the same priorities here. Um, and so I think it will kind of, again, fall on river advocates local river managers and communities to kind of step up and and help fill that void to both respect and support tribal sovereignty and especially you know if we're not seeing that support from the federal level and so how can we be a larger advocate in that space is something that i think we should all think a little bit more about thanks kestrel and you know touching on just that relationship building and working through partnerships kind of leads us into this next question. Um, and this is open to all three of you. So um, what are some examples of unique partnerships or cross-sector collaborations in your work? And how do these shape the future of river management? As we all know, it's very disciplinary, very interdisciplinary type of work that uh, goes into it. So um, how about, we'll start with Ben and then we'll go to Tanji and then Kestrel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I'll try to bring up a, a couple of examples uh, that are specific to the, the work that, that I've done. Uh, first and foremost, in when I was doing my master's, um, my my thesis was on the the Chattahoochee River uh, in Georgia. Um, it is a river that pretty much spans from northeast Georgia and then dumps out into the um, well. It goes through Florida and then dumps out into the Gulf. But one of the biggest takeaways that that I learned about working with that river and 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 trying to understand it was that you know rivers are these systems that are transboundary managed so uh, a river is cutting through all these different uh sectors um it is it, it really takes um an interdisciplinary but also a transboundary you know management approach uh to get things done on these rivers uh and so that was one of the first times i really thought about um you know how how rivers and how collaborations work on on a management level to 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 make decisions um another um more applied example again is working with um iowa dnr on the little sioux river um or the ink baduda canoe trail as they call it uh where essentially for this master planning process there are several counties uh, involved. It's a 170 mile segment. Um, different water trails across the country have different sort of planning phases. There's different scales of water trails from the grassroots levels to the state level to, to, to the national level. Uh, but in this case, the Little Sioux River, their planning process, they have to engage multiple stakeholders from all these different counties. So they have basically divided these counties up into sections. And then uh, we will work um, uh, essentially facilitating three different groups, um, each group representing a cluster of counties 
where we will go and seek feedback and do stakeholder engagement sessions to um, to learn about the river. Uh, I think all of these are models for um, how any sort of river or specific to water trail collaboration should be done in the future. It really does take everyone working together um, and to hear that feedback um, and to have that sort of inclusive design built into it. Uh, the other just super niche thing that I'm working on, um, and I would definitely say it's a unique partnership, uh, is with some of the, the 360 uh, like Google Street View imagery um, that I'm working on. The city of Cleveland, uh, where uh, it's right on the, the um, uh, Lake Erie, um, Cleveland, Ohio. It is, there's the Cuyahoga River. Uh, this is a very famous river. Um, it, was, it, it caught fire. It was one of the, the original um, motiv motivations for the Clean Water Act and uh, the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency. So long story short, they have a pretty robust um, sewer district that manages all the water in the watershed that tries to uh, basically have a hundred year plan for evaluating all the water and the watershed that dumps into Lake Erie. And so right now we're on a project where uh, essentially, and, and Angie, if I can um, share my screen real quick, um, I'm going to replace current share. Sounds uh, good. Share my screen. Um, so can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. So um, so essentially uh, what this is, City of Cleveland, so this is kind of a um, just a very basic dashboard. I didn't want to get too much into the, the GIS data, um, but all of these little dots are places where you can click and actually see street view of the um, of the river or of the watershed. And so the project we're working on, it's a it's a big project. There's over 500 miles that we're capturing. And essentially, we have um, 360 cameras that are mounted on boats for areas that we can paddle. We have 360 cameras that are mounted on backpacks where we actually go and we hike into uh, the stream. So a lot of these are um, behind people's backyards or private property or in industrial areas. But this is a very unique management approach. Uh, I haven't really seen it done anywhere else in the country where they're using um, this type of data management uh, to inform ultimately, you know, water resource uh, conservation and management. Um, so that's just one unique example from my point of view. Cool, thanks, Ben. Yeah. How about, uh, oh, there we go. Thank Tanji again. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to talk a little bit about some of the partnerships that um, Long St. Rivers program is engaged in from the Forest Service. Um, and I would say these partnerships and in particular like funding programs that can come from partnerships really open the door for cross-sector collaboration because I mean, that's what our hope is, is that the door would be open, the invitation would be made so that you know, all angles of engagement. Opportunities and ideas that exist out there. Um, and certainly we've got to see a wide range, but I think there's just always potential for more. And so, you know, one partnership I would highlight would be um, our program's relationship with River Network. Um, we've got a stewardship partners funding program. And so across the country, there are tons of groups that make concerted efforts to do different stewardship activities along local rivers. And that can range from education to monitoring uh, to restoration um, and more, hopefully. And so that funding program is really what opens up the door to get that engagement um, from different groups that love their rivers for a variety of different reasons. And a new component of that funding program is actually money for the purpose of relationship building. And so there's, um, you know, such a huge community around um, stewarding rivers, but sometimes there can be barriers to building relationships. Um, there can just be connections that don't exist or maybe geographic barriers or otherwise, uh, especially with federal agencies, it can be difficult to sort of understand and navigate 
who does what and who the point person is for different things in different locations. And so the relationship building money and that folks can apply for is to sort of recommend like, hey, I think we're in the same lane here, but we've never sat down and plan and sort of talk about intersections and opportunities here. And oftentimes that can be um, groups that are a lot smaller um, or different. Don't ha or haven't been historically favored by the agency to be engaged. And so um, that's sort of an exciting thing that has opened the door to, to have more collaborations with different groups um, that have different stories and connections to Wild and Scenic Rivers. And let me see, I guess the other one that I'll highlight here, as far as the collaboration, um, it's been really cool to work with other programs in the Forest Service who engage um, different audiences. And so one of the cool collaborations we've done is um, a few activities with the freshwater snorkeling program on designated Wild and Saint Rivers. And so if you haven't heard about freshwater snorkeling, um, there's a lot of incredible biodiverse, beautiful, um, healthy river ecosystems um, in the Wild and Sink River system where people have the opportunity to look beneath the surface and see that there's a whole body of life, a whole ecosystem living and moving down there. And it really changes a lot of people's perspectives on what rivers are. It's not just one big, you know, Glowing mass of water. There's a whole world beneath the surface. And I think that's intriguing for, for youth, but for adults as well. And so um, trying to connect their holds a lot of potential and has occurred in a number of locations. So that's a wonderful um, resource for people who may not even be particularly interested in rivers or wild state rivers, but it is a truly and literally immersive <laughs> conservation experience that I think can be um, open the door for stewardship and just love of the outdoors in general. So. Awesome. Thank you, Tangi. And Kestrel, I'm curious to hear your perspective on this question. Yeah, yeah, I have a couple examples and also just want to say that I definitely want to go freshwater snorkeling. I can't say I have quite done that yet. So that's high on the list. Um, but yeah, one one example of a partnership that I wanted to highlight is a kind of very local project um, and one that is near and dear to my heart, both geographically and sentimentally. Um, but I'm working with the Forest Service on improving river access on the Taylor River. And so that's kind of just in my backyard. It's in the Gunnison River Basin on the West Slope of Colorado. Um, but kind of how we came into this partnership is even though the Forest Service and the, you know, through various federal, um, you know, funding opportunities has the budget to improve river access, they often don't have the staff capacity to actually see those projects through or, you know, be the project managers and, and have, um, you know, enough staff on the ground to really make it happen. And so we have been able to come in and through a formal partnership agreement with the local dist forest service district, we've been able to <clears throat> hold the contract with the design firm and then play the overall project manager role for the project. And so really just like bringing that, you know, additional expertise and, and staff capacity so that we can see these and, and realize these access improvements um, in a more timely manner. And, you know, I think that partnership has personally been something new to me. Um, and so I have certainly had to learn a lot and there's been you know, some some pitfalls and, and struggles just with figuring out, you know, the rules and regulations for formal federal partnerships and kind of the federal design standards for engineering and um, kind of everything involved with building and designing something that's on federal land and uses federal dollars, um, but where there is a nonprofit partner. And I do think, you know, depending on where we see 
trends go in terms of funding, federal funding for projects like these, I do think this need is still going to continue and probably grow to have those on the ground partnerships to help projects actually happen. Um, I know this is you know, quite common with organizations like the National Forest Foundation who work really closely with the Forest Service on projects like this, but I do think there is opportunity for other nonprofits or you know, counties, communities out there to work with the Forest Service and other federal management agencies to help, you know, essentially help them get these access improvements um, to happen and, and on the ground and make sure that there is sufficient community input and that it's a project that will be durable and also be supported by local communities. Thanks, Kestrel. So my next question, this one again is for Kestrel and Tanji. We'll go to you first, Tanji, though. Um, and, and maybe we've already touched on this a little bit in some of the your other questions, but uh, in your work with river communities, have you noticed any specific cultural or community-driven changes in river conservation priorities? Um, and how might professionals want to prepare themselves to address these? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. And yeah, this definitely goes on with some of the themes that we've highlighted, I think, collectively in some of the other questions. Um, and I will say that, you know, the priorities and values around rivers, I think there are some pretty central ones and unifying ones that, you know, remain regardless over time. Um, but there's been so much more momentum and actual um, timely dialogue of sitting down and sorting through what are the systems and protocols that led to unequal access um, to rivers and engagement there. And so I would say the conversation around equitable access, although it's been ongoing, it has so much more support resources. Um, and I think more of like a systemic approach to that topic than maybe in other seasons, but I haven't been around so long. So I'm not going to talk about things before, you know, before my era. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would say equitable access continues to be the ongoing conversation and value and maybe it comes up at, as more of a lens through which we talk about these other components of river conservation rather than like sort of a side topic or an addition, um, which I do think requires, um, yeah, looking at things through the system understanding, not just as like sort of a basic principle, but like what are, I mean, certainly it's nice to have data to sort of set the table in some ways, but also thinking about historical context and, um, knowing who plays what role in you know allocating access um and who influences those outcomes i think and so that's um being in such in um webinars like this i think can help to illuminate that but would just sort of encourage you guys as you try to get the big picture of who does what in the world of river conservation to just always ask you know whenever you get to speak with a mentor, who do you work with? What role do you play here um, to get a big picture of that network? And I think that's a key skill to have um, when you come in because it really helps you understand the strengths of you know, your position and the opportunity within your role and then how that fits with others. So um, yeah, that's what we'll highlight there. Thanks, Tanji. And yeah, Kestrel, if you have anything to add, I know you've also touched on this a little bit already, but. Yeah, no, certainly. And um, definitely want to echo everything Tanji just said too about equitable access. I think that's a huge, huge part of, you know, all, all of our work around rivers or, you know, should be. But, um, but yeah, in terms of kind of changes and community driven priorities, it made me think of, how, you know, for a long time, we've really been driving home, you know, how can communities, especially rural communities, diversify their economies and, you know, get more outdoor recreation, get more, you know, river recreation specifically, 
um, to support local businesses. And while I, you know, a hundred percent think that that's still true, especially, you know, for a lot of communities, at least, um, at the same time, some communities, you know, some that I've seen in person, some stories I've heard of, um, are really struggling with how to manage and how to have sufficient infrastructure to, um, you know, appropriately provide sustainable recreation opportunities while still protecting the values of that local community and then also protecting the environment and the local ecos ecosystems from impacts that that do happen from a lot of recreation. And so I think to the degree that we can to really focus on the sustainable part of tourism and, and river recreation tourism, um, and so that you know might include a bigger focus on educating the public, a bigger focus on river etiquette, um, as we bring you know new people into river activities and sports. How can we ensure that they are also getting um, getting that river etiquette lens and um, and having all the tools to not only recreate but do it in a in a really responsible way? Um, and I think that there's. You know, really it comes down to every community is different. Um, but across the board, if you have um, you know, recreation opportunities that exist in your backyard of your community, you really need the appropriate infrastructure funding and technical assistance to be able to manage that recreation. And so I think again, that's where you know partnerships come in really handy between nonprofits that can help with education or technical assistance, you know, federal agencies and state agencies that can help with funding um, and other and other aspects to make sure that we can keep people getting outside for a long time. Awesome, thanks Kestrel. Um, got a question here for Ben and Ben, I know you have really kind of touched on this. I don't know if you just had like a short summary of um, what you might just want to reiterate the one technical advancement in the last few years that has truly transformed your work and how has it improved uh, river management or restoration efforts? Yeah. Yeah. And um, again, I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen, but um, the, the 360 imagery, uh, or Google street view combined with, um, geospatial technology or, or GIS technology, um, I would say is the one huge, uh, adva advancement. It's something that we use every day, um, in our work. And, um, you know, there's really simple tools that everybody can, um, can access. Um, and so like, here, you know, I was in Germany and, and I'm thinking, uh, you know, what's like an uh, applied example that I can show um, uh, that is r right here in our backyard. So this is a city in, in Münster, Germany, and this is Google, Google Earth. So you can see this on Google Maps as well. Um, let me hide these uh, floating media controls. But one of the cool things like with Google Earth is like the ability to access historical imagery. Uh, and so you can go back and you can see like this one, this has historical imagery till 1985 and there's these little tabs here and you can see how places have changed like over time. And so this was a, um, a channelized section of the river right here. You can see right, right here. Uh, let's go back in time a little bit. Um, super channelized, you know, this is very, very common uh, when it comes to river management back in the day to um, gain control of the river and channelize it for for purposes and you you know you see us um, taking down dams all over the place you can do this at the Klamath too it's kind of cool to see um, but then you know you go to 2020 and they de-channelize this re-naturalize it whatever you want to want to call it and now it's um, you know it's opened up to a park it's starting to get its you know uh, original meander and so, again, this is just an example I was thinking of, like, this is completely accessible to everyone to be able to see land use or river use changes over time, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, but absolutely, Google Earth uh, and then the 360 imagery. Uh, Google Street View started in uh, around 2007. And um, it was um, pretty instrumental in changing the way we experience spaces, uh, particularly with streets and navigation. But now anybody, um, if you go to Google Images and you go to like all photos and you search, 
almost everywhere now uh, with the advancement of 360 cameras. Um, they're so cheap now. Many people have them. You see them at concerts everywhere. Uh, the military, real estate, the medical industry, these 360 cameras are starting to be found everywhere. And I really see traditional photography being replaced with uh, 360 photography. Uh, it's more uh, immersive. Um, uh, it is um, just an all around better um, photo. And so I just think it's uh, the coolest thing. Cool. Thanks for sharing, Ben. Yeah. Um, all right. So I've got one last question for each of you. Um, well, it's one question to all of you. And it's hypothetical, but if you could create one new role or maybe department, um, position, whatever you, you want it to be in your field, specifically to address some of the future challenges to river management, what would that role or position or department be? And how about we start with Tanji and then we'll go to Kestrel and then Ben. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks for including this question, Angie. It's nice to like, because like I was thinking about it and then I sat with Steve. So Steve Chesterton is the National Wild Rivers Program Manager for the Forest Service. So I wanted him to weigh on this topic too. But it gave us a chance to be like, okay, dream big. <laughs> yeah. um, which is nice because you honestly, you can't do your work if you're only looking at the issues. You need to have a vision too. Um, that's what keeps you going with some momentum. So anyways, all that being said, um, both of our ideas kind of have to do with like either a department or individual or some kind of strategy that that is able to harness like vast amounts of information. And so Steve, you know, wanted to talk a little bit about monitoring um, because that's such a key element of um, the Wild and Rivers program. In our agency, uh, our monitoring capacity is what really informs our ability to say, how are our management decisions going? <laughs> and how might we change? What strategies should we take into the future? But um, mobilizing resources um, and individuals and then parceling through the data is a difficult process. And there is a really amazing amount of data out there um, in, in regards to, to rivers. But in, in order to sort of coordinate it, to make sure, are we looking at all of these numbers through a similar lens? And then to make sense of it, um, it doesn't just require like computing power and knowledge, like it requires tangible relationships across a number of agencies, whether that be federal, state, or local academia um, as well. And so Steve was like, oh, it'd be amazing if we had a department or a team that was ded dedicated to harnessing all of that monitoring data, making sense of it, maintaining it, um, coordinating, you know, across all these different levels um, to, to make sense of it and to, to do more of it as well um, on Wild and Saint Rivers in particular. Um, and then similarly for me, I think it would be interesting to do something along those lines to harness ecological knowledge <laughs> um, and coming both from um, indigenous communities, which they're, it's, it's not something that is like, you just package it, you know, it's, it's a ongoing conversation, it's relational, um, and engaging with it is not like straightforward, it's not a textbook. And so I think like having a team who could, um, yeah, build like that community, build relationships um, to leverage that and also to include other forms of um, just ecological ecological knowledge around wild and scenic rivers and historical knowledge around our wild and scenic rivers as well would be very intriguing to me because usually it's like there's a lot of knowledge holders out there and they're so close and devoted and dedicated to the resource but they're not always like on the platforms like sharing everything they know and we we lose a lot of knowledge about these places we do we lose a lot of context um, when we don't connect with individuals. So like a living dynamic community of knowledge holders that um, preserve that knowledge and share it with the next generation will be 
interesting to me. Um, but yeah, Angie, let me know how, how we're going to do all these things. You got me thinking now, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good. The wheels are starting to turn. Mm -hmm. How about you, Kestrel? Yeah, a uh, couple of thoughts here. And this was, yeah, definitely an exciting, also challenging question. I mean, at American Whitewater, we really only have 13 paid staff around the country. And so depending on how you look at it, you could really you know, have a lot of growth there in different areas. But I kind of thought about this question more generally in the whole field of river advocacy. Um, you know, and I want to be clear too that I think a lot of this is already happening, but I think there is, you know, a need to have a greater focus on diversity and equitable access. I know this has kind of come up a lot today, but um, but truly I think, you know, river advocates are often born out of having those opportunities to explore and connect with rivers and develop that sense of place. And I think that really our goal should be, you know, to have a river advocacy, you know, population that's representative of our country's um, pretty diverse population itself. And so I think, you know, there is a direct correlation with the more folks that we can get out on the river and the more variety of folks that we can get out on the river the greater diversity we will have of people that are able to speak up for rivers. And I think that's gonna go a long way as we you know, continue to run into challenges with policy at the federal level. Um, and also just you know, for the pure amazingness that it is to have opportunities to get people outside and to see how special these places are. Um, and then just wanted to flag a couple of organizations that are really doing this on the ground and that's Diversify Whitewater um, and then the Paddle Tribal Waters Program from Rios to Rivers. And there's definitely others, but those are two that that we work pretty closely with. Um, so if there are, you know, opportunities for you and your work as a advocate or river manager or a decision maker, um, I think we could all be doing a little bit more to support to support these efforts. Yeah, thanks, Kestrel and Ben. Uh, curious about your answer yes yeah i think um the the reason i haven't finished my 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 dissertation uh is because um i i started doing this uh with with parks 360 so um i really believe in uh reality capture uh the 360 imagery that i'm talking about i think to go off tangy's point sort of preserving knowledge not just um, from the context of, of people or passing down oral traditions or um, passing down other forms of knowledge, having a baseline digital representation of a river uh, conserves it. Even though that, that river and that, that imagery might be a, a shot in time, when you take uh, imagery uh, in general, traditional imagery, but more specifically 360 imagery, and you create a full virtual tour um, it, it, it preserves that in time forever into, into eternity. Uh, and there's really no reason why um, we don't have more access for everyone digitally to our natural resources, whether it's trails, whether it's rivers, um, it just needs to be done. You know, Google has almost mapped 99% of the world's streets um, that needs to be done for, for resources. And I, I do think there's a caution there um, you know, I, I think there's also the, you know, the wilderness debate. I think there are some areas that, you know, maybe shouldn't be accessible. Maybe we shouldn't bring technology into it. Uh, there's tribal concerns where maybe we shouldn't take photography of certain areas. Uh, but I think in the places that we can, in the places that we have permission to do that, uh, we have a duty or a mission to preserve these places. And so photography is a really, really powerful tool to do that. And so um, the department I would create for, for any natural resource management agency uh, would be um, 360 imagery teams. So that's my spiel. <laughs> <laughs> cool, well, thank you all again for joining. I know that we're kind of hit our time for those who uh, maybe had to join late. We have been recording. And again, I am going to put this on the RMS YouTube channel. I'll put it on our career series playlist. I'll also send it out to everyone who registered. Um, and I did see one question come in about what is, and this will be kind of like our final question. Let's see if we can 
do it in a nutshell here. Um, but if, it, if any of you have a piece of advice for someone who's just starting out that you wish you had known earlier in your river career. I'd be happy to speak to that one, Angie. Um, so for me, I would say something that would have been nice to lean into a little bit earlier would be really digging around to understand the infrastructure behind your work, if that makes sense. So the relationships, the funding, the policy, the context, um, because sometimes like, and maybe it's already apparent, like even as a student, but I think folks who are really passionate in this line of work have so many like wonderful dreams and ideas and how great would it be if we could come to work every day and just deliver those and see those results. Um, but there's just a lot of like um, barriers and things that require upkeep and maintenance in order to deliver those great ideas. And you have to be really responsive to those shifts in the needs of communities and, and you know the political aspects of your work, the geographic location that you're in. And so really like keying into like what makes your this organization go or what makes our team go or um, just getting into that infrastructure, I think will help you to be more strategic and stay encouraged about the pace of your work. Because yeah, I think being a student is an amazing opportunity because you get to um, provide new insight and ideas and research uh, different questions and challenges, but how do we deliver them requires a lot of strategy, relationships, and logistics. And so setting yourself up to know what those things are earlier will give you a really strong start, I think. Cool. Thanks, Tanji. And I know Kestrel had to run to another meeting. Um, ben, I don't know if you had any final thoughts. Yeah, uh, Macy, I was going to say just great question. And and I, I mean this genuinely. Um, I guided for about six years on rivers and I'd never heard of the river management uh, society. Um, I think if I would have uh, known that the RMS existed before there before then, um, that would be the one thing um, that I wish I had known earlier. Um, I think just the fact that you're on this webinar, uh, that you're staying engaged, you've really found the, the right place to to have a career in rivers. And then Above all of it, just do not forget to enjoy rivers and get out, make a trip part of your everyday life, uh, join a chapter, do something uh, where you're engaged with rivers, maybe outside of work. Um, but most of that's common sense to everybody here. Excellent. All right. Well, with that, I just want to say thank you again um, for sharing with us today. And thank you everyone who joined and hope you found today and some of the other sessions in this series useful. I'm always looking for topics and ideas for the next series. So feel free to email me any feedback. I also have a survey that will... Um, pop up once you exit the Zoom, but I just put my email in the chat in case you have any other ideas or things you'd like to share. So uh, thank you all again, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their week.